We have a good time. We have a real good time. My name is Jack Terracloth and this is... Cabaret Madness. You Betty. People in their best dress clothes, covered in sweat. It takes a certain kind of crazy to be under World Inferno. Yeah. The world Inferno is about the world the way you wish it was. Sort of capturing that moment and preserving it. as part of it, the, um, this kind of sense that there's something going on here that's bigger um, than just a band, obviously, there is. The person that got me into them, uh, she was like, uh, you know, going to their first show, whatever, changes people, people's lives. And I was like, yeah, whatever, people say that about a lot of things. And then I saw them a few times, and it did completely change my life. I've been going to shows for the past seven years, every single New York show. Uh, this is essentially my life. Uh, there's nothing else going for me. And I've canceled family vacations. I've canceled family gatherings because I had to work with Old Inferno. And I have no regrets about that whatsoever. I mean, these people are my friends and my family. It, I guess it's also probably worth mentioning that like, a lot of the kids that come to the shows regularly, like they're called Infernites. There's a cult. There's there is a, a cult definitely following. a cult. They, they will be here tonight. They're like, How did it come about? Well, it wasn't this band called Sticks and Stones. We didn't do so well, and it kind of made us angry, so sadly, I needed a new approach to actually have fun. Good. Ready, Mr. Chesky? I guess we'll try the usual one. And I knew Jack from Sticks and Stones. Back then, he was PV. When I was a little young at the time, I was like 16 or something. So, you know, I had to I had to be, you know, kind of like assertive about, hey, hey, let me play guitar in your band. As soon as they started recording Bridgewater Astral League, and that was when they brought in, like, me and Benji. And that was about when Semra came into, that was over 10 years ago now. And, uh... What a long, crazy ride it's been. <laughs> There's a nice vibe upstage. I feel good about it. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, no, like, yeah, after me, right? Is that what you said? I think that's what I said. That's what you said. Younger me, V, feeling grudges. Velocity. Yeah. It is a nice venue. Shame it's going to be destroyed. The one and only Village Voice ad I ever answered in 1997 was for, it read as follows, Insane Punk Circus Seeks Bass Clarinet. And I thought, if I only ever answer one Village Voice ad, it's going to be this one. The music is unclassifiable. There's no way you could put this in a certain genre. I've heard everything from show tunes, cabaret, circus orchestra. Swing, ska, klezmer, punk. Polka, cabaret, punk, you know, I guess yeah, that's a good. I want to continue punk rocking, but not with the punk rock music. So uh, somebody said, you know, I've heard this Kurt Vile record. Do you know the Three Penny Opera? Totally political, totally fast. You should look into that. So circus music. When I first started playing with the band, I thought to myself, well, um, what am I going to wear? You know, everybody looks good and everything like that. So I asked Jack and I said, you know, what would you like me to wear on stage, if, if anything? And he said, every show we play is a special occasion. So I would like you to dress as though it's a special occasion. I mean, the first show I went to, I showed up in just, you know, jeans and a t-shirt, 
and half the crowd was in uh, suits, nice suits. The girls were all in dresses. Guys had like face paint on. And we're going, you know, did I miss a memo? What's going on here? It's an elite secret insider thing. Other, pe other yeah, people don't understand. It really just means I'm a pretentious asshole within the inferno yeah, scene. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> That's pretty much what it means. Or to most people, me somebody just trying too hard to be like Jack Terry Cloth. We're trying to set the tone of, of this, is a, this is a space unto itself with its own rules. At the same time, the things that go on in this, in this autonomous space are of the utmost importance to people's lives place for saying I can do whatever I want and know exactly why I'm doing it I'm with people who understand and people who are who are all crazy weird loners as well but that we can all come together and have this sort of experience that makes us feel like we have a place in the world how the hell are you doing tonight we're gonna have a damn good time together I promise you that time I'm doing Mussolini, you know, being an Italian American and trying to be tough. Who's the toughest Italian, you know? Mussolini. Um, yeah, I, I can do it now. That's just, that's just gesturing. But. Oh, I thought it was holding a wine glass. Could be, could be. It's not holding no. a wine glass. Mm. It's Mussolini. Mussolini all the way. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I just kind of, I never, never know what the kids are going to pick up on. Well, this whole thing wasn't there. At that time, it was like 35 people at Brownies. First words I think I said, I was just like, wow. They were definitely different from everything else and something you kind of like had to see again. <laughs> And uh, that's when like, I they got hooked. Wow, I mean, what yeah. the fuck was that? <laughs> First time I met him, he growled at me. This is back when they still blew fire. And uh, they set the speakers on fire, and Peter Hess had to shake up a beer and put it all out. At that point, I had been going to punk shows for 20 years, and I had never seen anything new until these guys, because of that guy and the gestalt that is Inferno. They were very intimidating. No one really went up to them. They were scary. They just seemed like very dark and almost evil, but fun. Um, like it was a big, like crazy party they were having and there was more going on there than, you know, you realize. We're gonna go time, my friends, when we're all gonna die. And what will you have when you die? You'll still have the blood, but it won't do anybody any good. And you'll have all these memories, and the only good the memories will do you is that you're gonna cry and make your friends cry. And then you got your world, and then you got your inferno, and, and let's be acquainted. They had all these weird stories. And if you, if you tried to ask them straight up, like, is there something going on here, you'd get shifty sideways eyes and, yeah. and a change of the subject. And something as weird as that concept record that they did, which because, you know, a lot of that shit's true, and it shouldn't be. And a lot of it's not true, and it should be, so, you know, you'll figure it out or not. And that's, it's not really anyone's place, but to people that, you know, live through it to really know what went on. I don't need to create mysteries. No. I can, I, I point them out. But they are. And, yes, well, back to inertia. 
which mm. all they do is give a little push to these things. Then it takes over people's lives. When I lived in Westchester, um, when I was growing up, and uh, there was, you know, uh, it was difficult to find rides, you know, so I convinced a bus company in Yonkers to uh, rent me a bus. So when all of those kids came, started coming to shows, I brought all those kids on the bus, there was a lot of, I got a lot of flack for like, you changed the scene, man. And I was like, I mean, yeah, I, anybody and everybody who was supposed to come, should come. Friends, ever feel like giving up on it all? You ever feel like just saying, fuck it? Ever you feel like, what the hell am I doing in this godforsaken town, in this godforsaken state? Yes. We're not alone, friends, because just like you, I dropped out of the old school. <laughs> When you get to a certain point where you decide what you want to do, you look for antecedents to yourself, people who had to make similar choices that you have had to make or do make. The next record is all about Peter Lorre, because um, he seems a particularly good example, which might not speak well for us. So, yeah, punch my ears. The historical elements of the songs are choosing to sing about um, Paul Robeson or Jeffrey Lee or Peter Lorre. Um, that's all kind of giving us some lives and ways of living to um, consider. If you look at Paul Robeson's life, he was someone who really stuck out for what he believed in and um, even though it cost him his career, he never backed down. If there's one word, and I agree that this is not unique, Defiance. It's defiance. Defiance in the name of intelligence and informed intelligence. It, they are a punk band, in my opinion. They're a punk band, but not in the music sense, in just the sense of the word punk, about not being, not letting yourself being told what to do. Let me make this as brief as I possibly can. I've got something to say, and I'm going to say it clearly and slowly so everybody here understands. Films, there's a message in this song, and the message is... Fuck the police! What we're in front of the sort of ethos and the spirit that it espouses is just um, being true to yourself and standing up for what you believe in. And that is sort of a nice way like, to wish the world was, because it's not really like that, obviously. So people always have to sort of bend and like give in to certain things. So. And we're from the saying, what if you didn't do that? What if you just did this? This next song is a sad number. It's a sad song about your parents finally realizing that you're not the child they always wanted. It's about the day you don't come home when they get that phone call on their answer machine saying, Mrs. Cloth, Mrs. T. Cloth, we've got your son down here at the station. If you could come bail him out, this is what happens when you pick up a telephone and you say, I shot President Reagan and I'm going to do it again and again and again. Uh, when I was in high school, I actually did threaten to kill President Reagan over the telephone. 
and uh, <laughs> was arrested by the Secret Service for it. It was funny at the time. I mean, you know, these are true stories, and it gives you someone, gives you something to live by, some, someone to look up to. You know, and I don't know if Jack Terrycloth wants to be an idol, but he is. I think he has an undeniable charisma, so it, you know, it sucked us in for ten years. No, no, uh, you know, being broke. <laughs> so I think other people also have have enjoyed it too. Fellas, fellas, too much testosterone is bad for the skin. Just look at me. Big fan of uh, Jack. He's one of my heroes. He's such a, a good person to look up to, you know? You, you see him and you, you hear his stories and his tales and you're like, you know what? That's what life is all about right there, you know? That's what life is all about. If you hang out with people who, you know, um, who take a lot of risks, who do a lot of crazy things, um, you know, who break things or whatever, you know, you're gonna you're gonna kind of try to emulate them because everybody, I think, everybody wants to fit in to a certain extent, you know? We came in the club, it's nice, and said, what a beautiful, beautiful building. It's such a goddamn shame. doesn't act like any other band, it doesn't fit in with any other band, but they fit in everywhere. Over you know, the last decade of just playing everywhere and anywhere, they've created a scene of, you know, they went to each little scene and grabbed a few kids with them, you know, and kind of like created this weird mix of, you know, wacky kids and kids not being a age-defining term, more of a spirit divining term, you know? <laughs> or once they redid the website and the message board got on, it really kind of helped bring a community aspect to it all. I mean, it kind of helped people communicate after a show, like right after. The next day they could say like, people, and then they people put, were. then after a while they're like, oh, well, let's meet next time. And so they started to meet and it became much more of a community thing. And it really took off after that. It was kind of amazing to see, <laughs> like, a little message board would have such a big impact. That's kind of where the stupid. scene converges. That's where people actually get to know each other more. So, you know, if you're on the board, we know you. If you're not, then we don't. I mean, it's part of the mantra. I think people are into it. And they just hang out and talk to each other. And um, the whole scene is like, if you're a woman or a man or a girl or a baby or whatever the hell you are, come and hang out here. And that's more the barrier. Everybody was uh, kind of commenting how this is the first Inferno baby, the first Inferno spawn baby, because uh, yeah. we're the first people to meet in an Inferno show and actually, you know. She went to a lot of shows <laughs> in utero. And we used to joke with all the new kids on, on the message board and all the new kids at the show and say, you know, our daughter who hasn't been born yet has been to more shows than you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was actually true. David Vilmas had put on the show in Purchase, New York. We both knew him. We started talking. That's and how we met. started talking. And met. This October, we're getting married. That's the short version. That's the yes. short, short version of it all. Yeah. I was always different and weird, but I didn't have any kind of outlet for it um, on the scale of, of what the world Inferno is for kids. And this is the place where they um, are free and are themselves or are some totally made up version of themselves that, that they find to be more real than, than the way they've been living most of the time. Big holiday y'all have. What do you do on this holiday? You put a tree in your house. No one asks the obvious question. Why the hell is there a tree in your house? I'm here to tell you. Because you worship a plant. And that's why I like you. Because I worship a plant as well. Friends, you worship a tree. It's a short, short jump to the Great Pumpkin. Great pumpkin. It 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 can, you know it originates from like you said a Charlie Brown thing, and it turned into a 
spiritual Halloween celebration mm -hmm. of, of um, you know, almost like this is, we're giving honor to the great yeah. pumpkin. And we're Halloween going to every Halloween. Roots. Yeah, and so now that's, that's what Halloween is, is about, you know, being in the pumpkin patch. Hey, come on, come now. The most night of the year. We're so honored tonight to be the band that plays the devil's ball. For children candy and behaving badly, what would we do? The burning we effigy of Jack on top of a car outside the Good Bad Art Collective in 1999 was pretty exciting. Oh no, you're talking about 2001 where we burnt, we burnt everything down. Right, Jack, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> that's when we got kicked out of the Good Bad Art Collective. Um, but, but why? The climax of the show, um, a few years, I think they did it, where but at the end of the show they would just raise up the garage door, which was like one half of the whole, the whole wall of the place, and then everybody would pour out into the street. Jack climbed on top of a car and lit an effigy on fire. Police and the authorities showed up, and yet no one got hurt, and no, and no one got arrested. Everyone thought it was, everyone thought it was cool. Even the police were like, wow, it looks great. And, you know, I hate to agree with the police. And I was like, yeah, it really does. And it was just amazing. It was such a, it was such a, like a, like a primal, like sort of tribal ritual feeling. The pumpkin so much adrenaline that was, and was burning with, with um, like lighter fluid and different things got smashed. And then we were picking it up and taking bites of it, <laughs> eating it and passing it along to other people. But that's the whole thing about these uh, pseudo-religious ceremonies that the person becomes the thing and the thing gets destroyed. So I'm, I'm a cipher. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that's why I'm for the kids. Because yeah, I'm not me up there. I'm, I am the cipher for what they want. So, and, we, and we burned that. Will you dance with me? Because I think I'm having a hard time. They have two waltzes and a tango, and you don't see that at punk shows with yeah. stage dives and pits. You should. It's a punk rock. That's kind of the thing with Inferno. <laughs> Which is probably why they'll never make it completely mainstream. Because they're too smart. <laughs> uh, you know, it's what makes people famous is is being able to cater to the lowest common denominator, and and Inferno will never do that. We were recently approached by Mitsubishi Motors, an effort to use one of our cars in their commercials. They figured one of those crowds about turning 17. It's going to be time for them to buy cars soon. To help out our friends at Mitsubishi, we've written this next number, which we humbly call "Every New Car You Buy." makes the poor baby Jesus cry. A lot of bands are just kind of singing about what they feel like they should be singing about, but not really, not really acting into their own lives. And to me, you know, I feel like life is, is your own piece of art, you know? World Inferno cost me many jobs, and it made me uh, uh, broke and with terrible credit and homeless. <laughs> and I still love it, I don't know why. That's part of the deal. <laughs>
the same kid. I'm just 20 years old. And they can be 20 years older and still be doing whatever the hell they want to do. Somehow this group of people, like, for whatever reason, we're still doing this. We're still playing shows, you know, whatever. Crashing on floors, like, on tour half the year. Like, somehow, I don't know, we've all figured out, like, this is what we want to do and this is our life and this is what we want to be doing. And that's, that is kind of nice about it. It's a bit of a circus, yeah. If you're looking for someone to tell you it's okay or you're looking for someone to, to hold up a beacon or a flaming torch or some flaming 140 proof alcohol or whatever it is and, and kind of light the way for you, that's a way that this band has, um, has affected my life in that they've, they kind of showed me that it's, that it's possible um, or maybe it's impossible, but it can still be done. World Inferno uh, is about believing in something and that's why you get the rap of being a cult all the time and maybe it's a little bit of looking back and taking yourself too seriously but it's hard not to because <laughs> it just because it because it really is that amount of sincerity and is that amount of of, uh, of joy you know we are the world of Final Fashion Society, your friends from Brooklyn, New York. International service comes. Wherever you need us, there we'll be. It's time for the special show to go on and for you guys to wave goodbye. Wave goodbye to the circus. Thank you very, very much. There's a lot of kids who go to shows now that are very young. They're gonna be like us, and as they grow older, they may leave the scene and never come back, but there are always gonna be a core of kids. There's three of them right here that will probably always be going to shows. <laughs> mean it anymore you don't show up. I still mean it. And Terry Cloth will mean it until he dies. Life doesn't ever ever have to be dull. Just do something about it. That is a mantra designed for people who say it enough to be able to incorporate conflicting ideas into their brains. The positive and negative aspects of the world around you and the absurd things that happen to you will make more sense. World Inferno Friendship Society. The more you say it, the more your brain em embraces the absurdity around you. This will make you a happier person. The way I heard it was it was a thing while Jack was in high school called the World Inferno Friendship Society. Uh, Dante's Inferno is where they took the name from. Just the different people you're going to meet in hell when we all get there. <laughs> Incorporate opposing ideas, like any particular opposing ideas? Life and death? Well, those are not something no more subtle than that. Just I that, see. um, I don't know, I can't think, what's, what's something that really bothers you? Me? To something that just, mm. just doesn't fit together, like, you want to sleep late and yet... During the Cold War, there were all these, these international, um, sort of, uh, cross iron curtain, Friendship societies, like the, the, the Chinese American Friendship Society, they fostered just like 
communication between uh, capitalist and communist nations in a ostensibly a productive way. And so that's where the friendship society comes from. It's a Cold War metaphor. The president, institutions, the government, the United States, imperialism. Yeah, uh, that, the saying our name won't help you with those kind of things. No. I'm talking more about not quite abstract things, but things that usually confuse and frustrate you, mm -hmm. such as see that's that's a big question. Love. Lo you love someone, but but it hurts so much to mm -hmm. love someone. World Inferno Friendship Society, people think it's a friendship between the band and the fans. It's not really about that. The band and the fans are the world. It's a friendship with hell. And then you got your world, and then you got your Inferno, and, and let's be acquainted. It's taking the world above and the hell below and bringing them together. Lines. I hate lines. Like it's oh, waiting in line? line. Yeah, yeah, long yeah. lines. I just sometimes put everything back, yeah. you know? I, I just mm -hmm. walk out, actually. <laughs> I've been doing that lately. Don't put everything back and stuff. Kim World in front of you with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have freedom from lines. Mm -hmm. Just walk out. If they really want you to pay that badly, they'll come after you. Uh. They're definitely a lot more responsible than they've ever been and more careful about what they do. <laughs> Um, in some ways. Yeah, in some ways. <laughs> More than they were. More than I mean, they were, that's for sure. Uh, that's I mean, for there sure. were shows that I've been to where they set off fireworks in the middle, like in a small bar in, in New York City, and, you know, they would hand off the same ID to like four different girls just to get in. Um, the, band would the, band. the band would come out with, every, with all the band members' IDs. Who needs an ID? Yeah. Most of you are old enough since you're in here and you're all over 21. I said you're all over 21. <laughs> And it would and somehow work. And it, it, it would work. And, you know, we're just crazy stuff like that. You know, like when they almost burnt down brownies, I was there. It started as most of their shows did. You know, when Tattoo Space started, Semra would light her symbol on fire. And Jack would blow flames a couple times. Now, the, first, the, the place had an arch like this over the state. But the first time he did it, there was a monitor hanging above the stage, and it kind of, you know, it's an alcohol, so it just kind of engulfed the monitor, but since it's alcohol, it burned off really quickly. It's like, wow, all right. But the next time he did it, he faced the arch, more close to the arch, and he got a really good flame out of it. The arch was made of fabric, so it kind of caught a little bit of it, smoldered, and then started to burn, and eventually just kind of went out. But you could see, like the rest of the show, there was a small little burn area. I mean, you could tell that they were going to get in some sort of trouble, but I didn't think a pan would be happening. Originally, he had a, a cocktail glass, and, and I said, we don't, we don't. We do drink cocktails, but wine is more appropriate. You got to drink red wine and do whatever you feel in the heart. That's what it's all about, you know? A lot of drinking outside, a lot of drinking inside, uh, and of course it's always going to be the fancy suits and things like that. Empty bottles of wine everywhere. It's a little bit of a show. Uh, you're, you're in the band, aren't you? I'm like, yes, I am, man. I'm in the band. Because well, you're not going to drink on the job, are you? And I said, oh, oh, heavens, yes. Oh, oh, yes. The alcohol definitely brings yeah. something to the shows. Yeah. Like, I mean, it makes it that much better. But I, re I remember the last time I saw him, like, I couldn't help but think, like, man, that singer is trashed. Just the way he was, like, passing around I mean, wine and everything yeah. in a Nalgene hey, bottle. How's it going? What are we, what are we in right now? Uh, a documentary. Oh, I didn't on what? There was a camera there. On what? I'm, I'm, Inferno Culture. Oh, Inferno Culture. Inferno Culture. <laughs> <laughs> here, here, here it is, right here. Here she is. <laughs> hey, <laughs> motherfucker. Oh, hey, <laughs> That's how it happens. How are you doing? Hello. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I like you have to go on. I think he might feel awkwardly about me. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Yeah, whatever. It's okay. All right, I guess we're on the way to Inferno culture started in Tom's River. Tom's River, New Jersey. Fuck you. It started in Westchester. Westchester, New York. River. Westchester. I'm going to kick your ass. Westchester. Check it out. I have so badly. I'm going in. I've been sitting in a goddamn van for a thousand hours. Sorry. Lovely to see you. There's the alcohol. What up? Wow. There's a lot of alcohol in here.
Our uh, second baritone player, Mr. Dan Bailey, who came to be very, very, very important to the group, uh, grew up in Denton, Texas. Uh, in Denton, Texas, there was a, a collective called the Good Bad Art Collective uh, that every year celebrated the three-day festival of Hollow Mass, which is around Halloween, the day before and the day after. When we got Dan Bailey, or he joined the band, uh, a lot of his cohort, cohorts from Denton, Texas moved up here as well and formed another Good Bad Art Collective. And uh, right when Keep Street closed, uh, we moved into there, moved into their basement and started uh, making that our base of operations. And they already had a tradition of, of celebrating Hollow Mass as a, uh, a Christmas and New Year's and... I'm trying to think, see that's the problem, it's a religious holiday for no religions. Halloween of 2000, I didn't have anything to do. And you're just like, well, my band's playing this big Halloween show. It's kind of a thing. The Good Bad Art Collective. And I went down there, and it was, uh, I finally found it. They had uh, Dan Bailey in a birdcage dressed as a pirate, hung about 20 feet off the street outside. And I came in, and there was a Misfits cover band playing in one corner. And uh, Peter dressed as a, as a Nazi general. And... Uh, and Lucky in drag, looking about six feet five, and uh, a naked Ryan Burse blowing fire, and one of the little uh, one of the, the little Manning brother juggling flaming clubs. He's probably about fourteen years old at the time, and I was, it blew my mind. I said, like, "Whoa, this is the greatest band I've ever seen." He made a brief attempt in the late '90s to kill Jack Terrycloth. There was a brownies show, and it might have spilled over into that one where we kind of announced that Jack Terrycloth would die. Right. And he... Would be reborn as... Did he have a concept for the told, reborn? He or told, the, yeah, he told Dan's old roommate that he wanted to be named after, a, after an Asian sauce called the favorite sauce that goes with everything. And so... <laughs> He decided in like a prince-like way that he was going to be favorite singer who goes with everything. Um, and so I think the, the burning effigy might have had something to do with that. It was, it was a white suit, one of his white suits and a pumpkin for a head, and the suit had died somehow. And I think that night, the owner of Good Bad got pretty pissed about it because we, I think we promised him that nothing would explode. <laughs> Right. And it didn't explode, it was just on fire. Right. <laughs> and, and he wasn't into that technicality. Right. He said something about the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think he punched him. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that happened. Candy was, corn fight. I was one of the people to hoist Jack up. Oh, did you hoist? I was, yeah, I was helping hoist. To, yeah, Jack was flying above the crowd at the end of the... You know, when it was time for pumpkin time, I guess it was during that show, right? Uh, at that moment, so yeah, just trying to get him, get him up there. It was very, you know, done by, you know, everyone was licensed and everything. It was totally cool. Now, friends, we all require a leap of faith. And, I'm about faith. and by the end of the night, so there were candy. <laughs> How many fucking? Bought, like it was things of candy corn did you? I mean, it was unbelievable the amount of candy corn. It's at North Six, R.I.P. Rest in peace. Um, just fucking thrown like thing after thing, I think it was like buckets and I think buckets. It was hundred pounds of candy. Corn. It was something like that. It turns out candy corn gets hot, then it gets really gross, and then it gets really slippery. The entire floor of this club was was covered in this orange and black. Viscous goo and everyone's shoes. You get home, Every, and everyone's like, shoes was, oh. were ruined. But so yeah. he had to hoist Jack up on a rope so he could fly over the audience. <laughs> right. was, While we were like, we could like actually stand up. It, it was like an episode of Scooby Doo. Their yeah. legs are going. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're sliding forward while Jack is not really flying. It's what he intended, but kind of dangling. He's kind of bobbing there. Uh, but so when we left the Good Bad Art Collective, uh, we took Hollow Mass with us. And we can continue to celebrate it to this day. And I bet we'll continue to celebrate it as long as, long as I'm breathing. Because uh, 
even if we don't play any other shows during the year, I'm sure World Inferno will play a Halloween show. You think your scene's dead, man? I got killed by some dim witch triumph of the will. Most people were very upset about the Miss Reifenstahl song. Someone you don't respect or like the goals of is offering you an awful lot of money. What do you do? Uh, Miss uh, Reifenstahl obviously went for it, which is fine. She, unlimited resources. That's her choice to make. But the same, you know, the Clash also signed, signed Columbia. Columbia, Third Reich, maybe that's, uh, that might be a kind of a hard stretch. But it's, a, but it's still a stretch you can see.